I've never been able to talk to a sperm donor. We've talked yeah. to egg donors, but not sperm donors. What is the perception around this anonymity and the shift in anonymity? Is it fear-inducing? Oh my gosh, I've got to protect myself. Is it just what it is? It's a little bit of both. It's a mixed bag. So you still have, like I said, the push for the longest time was you can do this anonymously. No one's ever going to find you. So you don't have to worry about what happens afterwards. And that was the sales pitch behind being an anonymous donor, whether it's sperm or eggs initially. Now it's like you have to be willing to accept the fact there's a good chance that the child or the parent may want to reach out with you in the future. We have new statutes like in Colorado where they basically banned anonymous donation arrangements anymore because they're following the European model where they believe, I think rightfully, that children who grow up into adults should have the ability to know where they came from and what things are in their medical tree or, or family history that are relevant to them. And so that does create the idea of a lot of contracts nowadays talk about, do you want to remain anonymous? Are you willing to have communication with the parents, the recipients, with the child when they're a minor, when the child, when they're an adult? Even sort of our codes in, in California require the clinics now to ask affirmatively, are you willing to be contacted by the potential children born from donation? And if the donor selects no, it still says we have the right to reach out to you when the child's an 18 and make sure that you haven't changed your mind. So the push is going towards this kind of feel because of things like donor conceived people, the different kind of activist groups that are out there saying this is really important for us, for who we are, what we need. And a lot of the state legislatures are bringing that on board to say, hey, we want to foster this ability to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that we're trying to push it on the legal side is we're trying to get away from anonymous donations. We don't normally control that on the legal side because we get matches sent to us from people who've already met on line through anonymous groups or through agencies or whatever else has already made the match work. You know, a lot of people don't even know they need a lawyer until they get to where you need a contract. It's, no, I thought this was a medical thing. Don't make me go see yeah. a lawyer. That's the last thing I want to do is to do a lawyer's. And I know, and I am one. Yeah. And that's just kind of part of what we do. On the legal side, I just got back from a conference in Orange County not too long ago where a lot of the push was we need to try to get rid of using the term anonymous. We call them now like non-identified arrangements instead because there's not really anonymity. There isn't. There really isn't. Um, but we don't want to create the illusion that this is going to be a long-term anonymous arrangement because it just it's not. Hi, I hope you loved this little excerpt of Storked, the podcast where we talk about all things family building and families. This was a little taste of the bigger episode. We call it a storked munchkin. If you love what you heard, I highly encourage you to check out the full episode wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find it on the storked website at storkdpodcast.com. If you're in the process of building your own family or exploring what family means to you and you want to stay up to date on all relevant topics related to family building, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. It's called Let's Start a Family and it is found on Substack. Happy listening.